accomplish the rest of the time. I get to build things, uh, break things, blow things up, and basically do basic research inside uh, spacecraft and space systems. And Dr. Reisman. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. I'm Professor Garrett Reisman, and I primarily teach graduate classes in various different aspects of human spaceflight. Although this year, starting in the spring, I'll be starting a, an undergraduate course in introduction to human spaceflight and operations. So there'll be an opportunity as an undergrad uh, to take, actually you can take any of my courses uh, if you get special permission in your, in your later years as an undergrad. So uh, I do teach those classes. I have a small research program underway as well. And uh, I look forward hopefully to seeing a lot of you at, uh, at Viterbi. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Mike Gruntman. Thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Mike Grundman. I'm professor of astronautics, uh, and uh, I also direct the master's uh, program uh, in astronautical engineering. Uh, so it's a very large program. And I teach uh, primarily graduate classes on fundamentals of space systems and uh, spacecraft propulsion and rocketry. Also, I'm engaged in research. I'm a co-investigator on a couple NASA space science missions. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. As you can tell, we have a, a great group here to, to talk all about astronautical engineering and, and its program. As I said, I'm going to be leading the conversation for the first half of the program. and the latter half, we're going to open up to Q&A with uh, your end. So please hold those questions for the time being, and we will get to you in just a little bit. I want to start the question. Uh, I think I'll first direct it at Dr. Irwin as chair of the department, but please, anyone else jump into this. Uh, it's always the simplest question to ask in the beginning, but probably the hardest one to answer. Uh, what the heck is astronautical engineering? Can, can, we, can we shed some light on that? Okay. Um, it is for people who are interested in space and working in the space industry or maybe doing space-based research, perhaps at NASA centers, perhaps in academia. And uh, the, the major itself starts out kind of like mechanical engineering, kind of like aerospace engineering. You can think of aerospace as mechanical with an emphasis on flying vehicles. You can think of astronautics as, as mechanical with an emphasis on spacecraft and rockets. Really cool. Um, any other ideas from anyone else as what astronautical engineering is? Or does that answer it? Yeah, I could add that uh, basically uh, a space engineering or astronautical engineering, astronautics is a major space of a broader aerospace, but traditional aerospace departments are focused on airplanes, primarily aviation and the related topics with fluids and the astronautical engineering specifically focused on space and it's a huge area. So basically anything that relates to rocketry, missiles, spacecraft, space vehicle, robotic exploration, planetary science, astrophysics type science, everything is a technical aspect. So astrophysics type science, all of this is in astronautical engineering. Now, given that there are a lot of similarities and overlap with aerospace, mechanical, and astronautical engineering, I want to let everyone in our audience know that you may not have an understanding exactly of what you want to do right now, and hopefully today's sessions will be helpful, but we also will have an aerospace mechanical engineering faculty session next week. I'll have Michael put some information in the chat right now, so you can make sure you register for that as well, so you can attend both those and get good, good coverage on, on both of these elements. Um, when we talk about astronautical engineering, I think one thing that's exciting and I'd like to hear from whoever wants to kick us off is what is current research, uh, what's the current research happening in astronautical engineering uh, in, in, our, in our department? Uh, what, what's new and exciting in astronautical engineering? Where are we going with this? Sure, well, I can take a, take a stab at that. Yeah. Um, uh, along with the other duties as a research professor, I also direct something called the Space Engineering Research Center. Um, it's actually a joint activity between a, another group that's here at USC and the Department of Astronautical Engineering. Um, the, the cool thing about that is we, uh, we have sort of eclectic interest. Uh, and from that standpoint, I mean, um, as Dr. Grumman talked about, uh, astronautics encompasses a large sort of body of either mechanical, chemical propulsion or chemical uh, chemistry, as well as electronics software coding, and it covers the gamut of that. So from that standpoint, it's, um, it means that in research for, 
for astronautics, at least at what we're what I'm doing here at the moment, uh, is focusing on aspects related to systems engineering for various vehicles that, as an example, may go to the moon one day. Um, we have a satellite in our clean room that literally is being integrated um, this week. We're supposed to get it out in two weeks. So we build physical satellites. But then in, in addition, we're looking at um, sort of expanding out from just building a platform that goes up, which we typically do all the time with satellites, to many of the other things that uh, actually Dr. Gutman talked about, which are robotics. So once you have a platform up there, what type of robotics might you want to use? So we're actually doing quite a bit of work in uh, what I'll call the sort of the next generation in space. And that is, instead of just building something to look down at the earth and take a bunch of pictures and send communications, we're building things that can build other things in space. So wow. that's, those are the sort of things we're doing here. And, and does that involve the dog on the moon or, or not? <laughs> well, one of the challenges is, can we get something to the moon to get the dog to bring it back, right? So that's what we're <laughs> working on, so. Awesome. Other, other research projects that might be going on that maybe you all want to talk about that you're involved in? Um, I was involved for a number of years in spacecraft propulsion, which is electric thrusters that go on spacecraft. I'm not actually doing that lately. I've, I've kind of changed gears and I'm working with a systems engineering faculty member, not directly on space project, but actually on, on uh, autonomous vehicles. So uh, algorithms for, uh, it's actually earth vehicles, uh, cars and airplanes. So, so I'm actually out of the space business right now as far as research goes. So let me just say just a couple of words. Uh, I'm uh, doing uh, work in, uh, uh, I would use the same word as Professor Barnhart mentioned, eclectic. Uh, so just uh, in, engaged in several areas, uh, all of them related to space and rocketry. But one of the most uh, uh, the consuming time is, uh, it has been going for the last 10, 15 years, it's a study of the heliosphere. This is uh, more on the space science side. It's uh, the region controlled by the sun or influenced by the sun and uh, the interstellar boundary of the solar system. So this is one of the main uh, thrusts uh, during the last 10, 15 years and it continues. And, and Paul, if I can I just, just uh, mention, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just. No, go ahead, go ahead, Dan. Um, Mike is being a little modest, Professor Grumman is, but, but he, uh, he actually won a many years long argument as to whether it was with NASA as to whether it was a good idea to, to do what's called neutral particle imaging to kind of look across the whole solar system um, and with a kind of eyes that aren't influenced by, by the bending motions of the magnetic fields. And he finally won the argument and they launched, a, they launched spacecraft to actually do this and they got results that went on the cover of Science Magazine. It was a big success. Well, I wouldn't say that I launched anything. So in space, <laughs> uh, things are very expensive and very complex. The word system engineering, again, by Professor Barnhart already was mentioned. It's a very complex and very expensive system. Even a simple high quality space mission is hundreds, plural, millions of dollars. And the flagship missions are $1 billion. So it's... Uh, you are part of a very big consortium always with the top people, scientists and engineers from the universities, from the government research centers and from the top industry. So it's again, it's a huge area. And when you're in astronautical engineering, you are dealing with academia, you are dealing with industry, you are dealing with uh, uh, government centers and they are not only NASA, there's a significant activities on the national security side. And I want to mention that in space, uh, if you look at the commercial space dominates today, but on the government side, more than one half of the government activities are in a classified national security program. So it's again, if you're interested in the issues of defense and other related, so the astronautical engineering is uh, the right area. But again, the commercial space is exploding now, not exploding in a negative sense, <laughs> but in a very positive sense. So we are, uh, with all the publicity, uh, this is really what's happening and the commercial space is at least three or four times larger than the government space. Gary, you're gonna jump in. Uh, yeah, I was gonna uh, kind of 
go along those lines that uh, Professor Grummer was just uh, talking about, which is, um, and in particular, the, the human space flight part of commercial space. So uh, all the courses I teach at USC and all and the research I'm doing all are focused somehow or another on human space flight, putting people into space. And uh, it's a great time if you're interested in this topic, because when I was uh, the age of uh, the uh, the students, uh, prospective students, the students that are on the call right now, we really only had one vehicle flying, and that was the space shuttle. In fact, throughout the 80s and 90s, two decades, we just had the space shuttle. Uh, we eventually built a space station starting near the end of the 90s, but but it was kind of, uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on, really. We just had, there was just kind of one game in town. Uh, and what's happening now is really just super exciting. So you have uh, SpaceX building the the Dragon and Falcon 9 system and flying uh, people on, on American rockets again, starting with Bob and Doug uh, just over a year ago. And you have, at the same time, you have a very highly publicized this summer missions, uh, suborbital spacecraft that uh, Blue Origin have with the new Shepard vehicle and Virgin Galactic. So you have Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson's company with Virgin Galactic and Spaceship Two. But then you have uh, Orion coming online with uh, the Artemis program uh, built by Lockheed Martin and the, the SLS rocket to carry it uh, back uh, to the moon. The human landing system with Starship uh, being developed by SpaceX, the Gateway Space Station. You have, uh, oh, and I didn't mention the Boeing Starliner, which hopefully will fly uh, probably early next year. And at the same time, you got this uh, brand new thing, which is uh, uh, private space travel by humans, uh, which has got a big uh, start this year, just this year, with uh, uh, Bezos Branson and now the Inspiration4 mission with the Axiom 1 mission coming up next February. So, man, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of engineering going on to support all those missions, all those vehicles, and all those different companies. And so it is uh, a super exciting time, uh, frankly, much more interesting time to be studying uh, human space flight than uh, when I was uh, graduating high school. So. And I want to add that Professor Riesman uh, really knows what he is talking about, and he spent more than 100 days on the International Space Station and mm -hmm. on the space shuttle flights. So, uh, yeah. yeah, 107. Not that I'm counting or anything, but yes, <laughs> 107 on the space station, and now uh, a, a co-host of a wildly popular podcast, Two Funny Astronauts, which I think you relive a lot of those stories. If anyone, if you want to plug that, uh, people can okay. go listen to those okay. stories. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, please. Uh, we need more subscribers. Please come listen to Two Funny Astronauts. Uh, and just keep in mind, our tagline here is that uh, we're not saying that we're actually funny human beings. We're saying we're funny for astronauts. And if you know, like a lot of astronauts. That's a very low bar. All right. We're not we're not claiming to be funny. We're just funny for astronauts. So so please tune in and check it out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, switching gears a little bit. And thank you for all of the, the color that you added in about research and, and areas of growth in astronautical engineering. I'd like to switch gears and talk a little bit about the curriculum and what our prospective students can expect to find. Uh, I think first starting maybe with the approach of the curriculum. What's the arc of the curriculum for an undergraduate student? Maybe, Dr. Irwin, you can jump in, kind of talk to them about what they would do in their first couple of years working all the way through. And then maybe other faculty, you can jump in with courses that you teach and how that kind of ties into what Dr. Irwin uh, discussed. Hopefully that works for you, or, but change it if you like. But uh, Dan? Okay, so uh, let me sort of work backwards a little bit from the end of the curriculum. So okay. the, uh, when you graduate in any Viterbi major, you, you do what's called a capstone. You do a kind of a design experience where, where you take all the stuff you've learned and, uh, and do a design effort, typically in a team. And it, for, for astronautics, that takes the, um, that takes the form of a, of a mission design. Uh, and a, that is the design of a, of a space mission. And mission, by the way, is larger than just, just a spacecraft or just a rocket or just anything. Mission involves um, kind of everything that goes in from from design all the way to operations and finally disposal of whatever assets in space the, the, you actually use. So uh, a mission involves making a business case for whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, a, there's technical design, uh, which involves stuff that you learned earlier in the curriculum. For example, in your junior year, you learn about what goes into a spacecraft, all the, the spacecraft subsystems, uh, attitude, thermal, power, propulsion. Um, and uh, flight, flight software, flight computers. Uh, and uh, before that, you, you learn the, the kind of 
the basics of how to get around in space, orbital mechanics, uh, how it is that, that, uh, that bodies tumble in space and how you can control that, how you can actually point things. Because spacecraft have to point very accurately. If you just think of dish antennas or even telescopes, uh, they, they, they have to be very precisely oriented in addition to being in the exact uh, location that they're, that they're supposed to be. Um, and so working backwards from that, all those astronautic specifics kinds of courses in, in spacecraft subsystems and related physical areas like, like orbits and, and gravity, um, they're all, uh, they depend on mechanical engineering courses like statics, dynamics, strength of materials, which are taken by kind of all three mechanically based majors, that is ME, AE, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, and astronautic. We all sort of share an underlying core of mechanical engineering courses. And those in turn are based on, on physics and math and, and some chemistry as well, chemistry or material science. So uh, the general focus of the, of the curriculum is we would rather that you, that you understand the basics of, some, of, of the physics that go into something because when you actually apply it in industry, there will be some, some practical training that they will have you do anyway. I'd much rather that, that we would all much rather you understand the, the deep mathematical and physics basics of how spacecraft type thing, systems work uh, than, than be able, for example, to, to operate some piece of software or, or be able to, well, even to be able to do practical skills like soldering. All those things are important, but the fundamentals are, are even more important. But the practical skills are important too. So uh, all of the Turby majors, except I think for computer science, have some kind of, of hands-on physical laboratory work. And we do a two semester lab course in the junior year where you learn um, how to how to make uh, physical systems interact with the real world, how to measure them, how to characterize them, really how you you learn how to actually be a a real uh, hands-on uh, scientist engineer. They're, they're not quite the same thing, but I won't really talk about the difference here. Um, and you build on that in your senior year. There's a project lab that uh, mechanical, aero, and astro all do, where you make teams and do generally a piece of, of experimental work. Uh, that's at the beginning of your senior year. And then in the second semester senior year, you culminate in this, this capstone design project, the mission design course, which actually is led by Professor Barnhart. Any other, uh, you want to jump in maybe to uh, Professor Barnhart or anyone else on, on courses that you teach to add some context and, and uh, maybe the, the, the ethos of that question is what's it like to take a class in astronomical engineering? I think our high school students to have this uh, problem imagining what class is going to be like in, 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 in college and specifically in the discipline. Is it different? How does it work? So I think that second question, we'll, I'll, I'll head it back to Dan. I think he'd probably be able to answer that a little bit better. Sure. <laughs> well, um, one of the things that, that high school and college students both have difficulty with is, uh, is if they take some course they tend to forget what they took before. But in engineering, you can't really do that. I mean, just for example, uh, in, in the two courses that I mentioned, I teach a course in the freshman year, which I'm teaching right now. I, in fact, taught this morning. I lectured this morning. And um, I used a, a kind of a basic calculus result to derive what's known as the rocket equation, which tells you how much speed a rocket can gain if it burns a certain amount of fuel. And in order to do this, you, uh, you use a kind of a basic um, integral relation that you that most people learn in high school, not everyone, it's not required that you take calculus in high school. But this is a kind of a tiny example of, of the sort of thing that happens all the time that we, we assume that you not only took, you know, trigonometry and calculus, but that you actually learned. It. And we assume that you actually learn Newton's laws and, uh, and that you can actually uh, use them to, to figure out what more advanced, um, you know, interacting mechanical systems do. Um, if you start with the things you learn in high school, moving up through through basic physics and mechanical engineering, you learn you get more advanced, you know, kinematics, rotating machinery. Uh, stuff in engineering can get very complicated, but down underneath, it's just physics, and you have to be pretty good at that stuff. Um, you have to be kind of agile in terms of of, uh, of poking around on the web and sort of figuring things out because. Nowadays, um, when I'm lecturing, if I've forgotten something, I'll just go right to Google and find it. And I expect you to be able to do the same thing too. 
as, as students. So, um, so don't expect that, that your professors are going to give you all the information to do your problems. Some of them you may have to go out and just kind of dig on your own. So uh, there's, there's all kinds of different courses ranging from just kind of lecture and problem courses taught out of a textbook, which may be a little bit like your high school courses, to much more open-ended courses where, where there's no real answers at all. You have, to, uh, you have to really figure everything out on your own. And that's more typical for the, for the end of your, of your time at USC, particularly the design courses. And the lab courses are like that too. This is somewhat of a similar question, but I'm curious to hear from others about, um, you know, we, we have somewhat of a balanced approach to our undergraduate education on theoretical background and hands-on approaches to learning. Can we give some examples of what um, a theoretical problem set or a course would be versus a hands-on course and how can students understand the differences between theory versus hands-on? Well, one example of a theoretical course would be, sorry, I'm monopolizing the discussion. You guys jump in anytime. I don't think anyone's arguing with you. I think they want you to keep going. <laughs> All right. You know, I'll give one example. If you're an astronautical engineering major, one of the key areas is, is spacecraft attitude dynamics. So what a spacecraft will do if you just leave it alone and how you can control it to make it do what you want, point the direction you want it to go, and as I mentioned before. And uh, this is sort of a mathematical area because uh, it involves the the kinematics of a rigid body rotation, which is a little bit gnarly. If you, if you go to take it, it involves a couple of nonlinear differential equations, which if you haven't hit those yet, you, you will, and you will, you will enjoy them a lot, I'm sure. And uh, in that course, you, you invert a lot of matrices, you, you, do, you do some computer studies, but at no point do you, do you grab a piece of metal and attach a motor to it or a thruster or a gyroscope and, and make it work. It's not a lab course, it's a purely a theory course. And if you've done a good job and you have a good kind of handle on a good physical intuition, when you come out of it, you'll, you'll understand how to design an attitude control system. But if you have a very kind of concrete practical mind, I'm sort of that way, I'm not a very good abstract thinker. I have to, I have, to have practical examples in, in my life to, to kind of connect the the, the abstract theory. I, I'm, a, I'm a crappy mathematician, actually. Um, I mean, I'm good at doing integrals and I'm good at trigonometry, but, but what they call real math, I can't really do that at all. Uh, and um, we have the, the required lab courses that, that connect to, to the real world, but actually the better job is the, is the optional things, the extracurriculars. And I'm involved in, in one of those. It's the, the Rocket Propulsion Lab, which is mainly undergraduates that uh, build, uh, build rockets, cast propellants, make motors, launch vehicles. They were the first student group to space a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a whole bunch of student groups all across the School of Engineering. And in aerospace, they have design, build, fly. Um, there, there's a number of robotics ones and computer science and I think mechanical engineering too. Um, there's, there's all kinds of these extracurriculars. They're not required at all, but there's a ton of camaraderie. Uh, you, you, you make friends, you importantly, when you interview for a job, they don't care necessarily so much that you got a 3.8 GPA, but they will care about what you did. And if you were in Rocket Lab or any one of these other student groups, you can tell them what kinds of problems you solved and what you know how to do. And any one of these student groups will give you good physical intuition about what can be done in the real world. And uh, it's if you don't do it, if you don't do anything physical like that, you're in danger of. of of, uh, of coming out of, of uh, engineering school, not really being able to build stuff, which is not the best thing you could be. So, but however, the, the graduates of the Rocket Lab in particular, I can speak to this. Every year, even during the recession, Rocket Lab alumni or Rocket Lab graduates got jobs, even when some of their compatriots were, were waiting uh, a few months without job offers. That was like in 2008, that was, you guys were just kids, but every once in a while there's an economy economic downturn and it's not quite so easy to get jobs but uh, but the hands-on student groups are are really good for for helping you do that well it's as if you're reading my mind because my next question and maybe we can have dr reesman jump in uh, to to start this one off is where does this all head for students that when they when they graduate and they go off anecdotally where do where do our students go off to and i know you have a lot of experience in industry um, and maybe you could talk about both sides of that of that process 
Well, my uh, my my fellow faculty members probably have better statistics on this, but uh, I can I can I, I can give you kind of a, a qualitative uh, uh, answer in general, just outline the different possibilities. So so really, when when you graduate with a with a degree in uh, um, ast astronautical engineering, you could do a lot of different things. I mean, there really uh, are many different options. But I would categorize categorize what most of our graduates do as either going. Uh, either on for graduate studies um, or, or going into industry and working as working engineers. I think those are the two most most common paths anyway. Um, if, you're, if you want to teach, if you want to do research, if you want to really push the envelope of scientific discovery, then you, after you get your bachelor's degree, you can go on for a master's and a PhD and do a thesis and, and uh, become a scientist um, uh, and, and eventually become a professor. Um, if you want to go out and build rockets and build spacecraft or, or build self-driving cars, uh, just because you have a degree in ASTE doesn't mean you can't go off and do uh, other related engineering disciplines um, in industry. And so there's, there's tons of different op opportunities out there. Uh, you can, and then you can kind of categorize those as either going off into startups, working in small entrepreneurial settings, uh, or going and working for big established companies, uh, and, or uh, and, and or starting your own. Um, so th there's a, a lot of different possibilities uh, within the industry and academic options uh, after you graduate. So if I can uh, step in uh, also, yeah. uh, in the past, say 30, 40 years ago, one could have an engineer, could have a very rewarding uh, career with the Bachelor of Science degree. Today, the situation is different. You would ultimately need to have a master of science degree. So many engineers uh, after graduation go to work for different companies and uh, practically all legacy companies, that means large companies, all of them encourage young engineers with bachelor's degree to go to school part-time and to get master of science degree while working and they support tuition. So I, our master of science program is one of the largest in the country and half of our students come, are coming all over from the United States, uh, from all uh, parts of the country. And uh, they work full time in Boeing's, Lockheed's, Raytheon's, uh, just you name it, all the leading legacy companies in aerospace, space and defense, and they're getting master's degrees. So so you have to think it, uh, keep it in mind uh, uh, in your studies, but you don't need to go all the way to the master's degree. You can start with your bachelor of science degree and then go to industry. And again, a, a lot of places. I also want to mention that it's a very important starting from your freshman and sophomore years to seek internships. In the Los Angeles is in the right place. We're still in the heart of the American space industry. You go during the summer to the companies, uh, large or small, uh, the second or third tier of subcontractors in space world and you get internship and you get a hands-on experience there you're exposed to the real world and again it's very important as early as possible to establish what kind of work you like and what kind of work you dislike because for some people it may be you will like to play with data for others you want to drill holes bend metal and the fire and blow up things so it's very important as early as possible to determine that and the internships are a fantastic way of doing that and again we are in the right place in los angeles there's a very large number of opportunities in government and outside of government in the industry yeah, in addition to all of your faculty supporting you and, and giving you the, the help you need to find those internships, we have a full career connections office that supports you and brings all these companies onto campus, both you know in person and virtually recruiting you as undergraduates for internships and then full-time positions post-graduation. And these are all the companies that you want to work at, whether that's Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, uh, Aerospace Corporation, they're, they're, all, they're all recruiting. They're all looking for, for, looking for you at USC. So there's, there's a strong history of students going on to find success and finding success directly with their bachelor's degree, as Dr. Gruntman pointed out. Eventually, yes, you want those companies to pay for your master's degree, but you get jobs straight out of college with your bachelor's degree, which I think is an important point to, to highlight. I'm going to have one more question for our faculty. And then while I'm asking this question, I want to open up to you as an audience to start asking your questions. You can throw your questions into the Q&A. 
And then I will remind you that it is a democratic process. You all can upvote who, what questions you want us to answer. I'm, I'm probably certain we're not going to get to all the questions. So we're going to go in the order in which they're upvoted to the top. I do want to highlight, though, that we should not be asking any admission or application related questions today. We want to focus our conversation about our faculty, about our curriculum, about the program. If you have questions about admission or the application process, I encourage you to register for one of our admission information sessions where we highlight the, the conversation. We can spend a lot of time talking about it and make sure we get that into detail. So please, let's focus our conversation on the discipline and on astronautical engineering and on our faculty specifically and, and be mindful of everybody's time. So my last question, as we start getting our guests to get their Q and their questions into the Q&A, um, when you think back to your experience as an undergrad or as a student going through wherever you went to school and where maybe you've taught at other institutions or have experience at other institutions, what do you think uh, is different about the USC undergraduate experience in the Viterbi School of Engineering and Astronautical Engineering compared to other experiences you've had dealing with other engineering students or other places? Well, I can say something about that relating to the Rocket Lab because uh, yeah. I've been um, I've been advising the Rocket Lab for many years, and this is a uh, uh, this is a group that handles a substantial budget, they, they spend like 50, 60,000 a year, which comes from a variety of sources, sometimes some inside the school, some from company donations. And um, they, they connect with outside companies, they make partners, they, they do all kinds of, of social things and networking things that, I mean, obviously, the internet wasn't present when, when I was an undergraduate, but um, if that's not obvious, well, it should be. But, <laughs> uh, so it isn't just because of the internet, it, it's because of basically who they are as, as the Turby undergrads, there, there's kind of a, uh, there's kind of a, a, an outreach and a way of collaborating and a, and a way that they work together that uh, I didn't, I didn't see it at Caltech. That's where I was an undergraduate. So um, I have a lot more to say about that, but I'm curious to see what other people say. Don't be shy. Yeah, I, I did my undergraduate work at University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philadelphia and my graduate work at Caltech. And I could tell you one big difference is uh, USC has got a much better football team. Uh, <laughs> and I, I say that kind of flippantly, but there is something to consider that you have access to the larger USC campus and student body. And, you know, as a student here in Viterbi, there are all kinds of extracurricular and social opportunities available to you. And I do personally believe that the undergraduate experience is a very important maturation and social experience. You're learning to kind of take live on your own for a lot of you will be living on your own for the first time in your lives, maybe, uh, and taking personal responsibility and, and learning how to exist in, in the real world, uh, even though you're it's not really a real world. But I, but I do think that that whole environment is very important and, uh, and, and, and a strong uh, thing, thing to consider when you consider your undergraduate experience. All right, uh, let's get to our question. We might have lost Dr. Barnhart, um, but we'll see if we can get him back. Um, let's get into our questions. And the upvoting is working. Remind you, just continue to upvote uh, the questions that you want to see answered and push them to the top, because uh, we're only going to go in that order as we work our way down. And uh, I will start with the number one question here, which is from Inimai. Can you highlight your partnership with NASA? I think it's something that we may not have really touched on, but basically how is NASA involved in the education and the research? And obviously students go on and intern and work at NASA as well. Can we talk a little bit about NASA? I, I can speak a little bit. I think NASA, uh, I, and I should have mentioned also when I gave the different possibilities of where our graduates end up between industry and academia, I should have also mentioned, mentioned government. Obviously there's, uh, a lot of opportunities to go work for NASA or for other parts of the federal government uh, uh, that that are doing things uh, that involve space. But um, but anyway, uh, as far as our partnership with NASA at, at Viterbi or at, in ASTE, I think uh, it, it comes in a variety of different flavors. I, for for example, I'm part of a NASA funded research institute that is providing the funding and and and. Um, the opportunity for me to do the research part of my of my program here at, at USC. Uh, that is a, um, a space technology research institute that, that we're a part of. Uh, and and so there 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 a lot a, a lot of research gets funded by NASA. Uh, at the same time, we have um, 
I have a lot of guest speakers because my personal experience at NASA, I have a lot of guest speakers in my classes that come from NASA. So there are a, lot, a variety of different connections on a variety of different levels, I would say, is the best answer I can give to that question. Yeah, so if I can add uh, that uh, the research that is being done on the USC, the, the School of Engineering at USC is a uh, research uh, oriented. The USC itself is a so-called research university. So it's an elite group of the universities in the United States and the School of Engineering by itself uh, uh, qualifies uh, the definition of a research university. So the faculty drives the research activities on campus. USC practically does not fund research on its own on a very small scale. It's primarily faculty go to the outside sources of funding and support, which is government. It's the National Science Foundation in many areas, but in space, it's a primarily NASA. NASA headquarters, actually. Occasionally, NASA centers such as JPL and others, but it's primarily NASA headquarters. And the faculty get their research grants and contracts, and students are involved in these kind of projects uh, uh, that are overseen and directed by the USC faculty. So uh, having JPL next door is very convenient because uh, we have a number of top specialists at JPL uh, teaching in our program as a part-time lecturers. They want to give back to the community. This is a particularly strong in the, in the graduate program, but also some of our undergraduate courses, and Professor Irving could uh, be more specific and explain this. Some of our undergraduate courses are currently taught by current employees in, at J, from JPL, and this is a tremendous opportunity uh, to interact with the real people working at the front lines uh, in the government programs in NASA. And uh, this is also a very important link to get internships there. So it's again, we are very close to one of the biggest NASA centers. A number of our students go there as the interns. And also uh, some of our faculty have grants and contracts from um, NASA and NASA centers. I mentioned that I'm a co-investigator on two NASA missions that are in the final stages, but it's again, it's not major NASA missions. And I participated before that as a team in a number of other NASA missions. Um, I'll mention something that happened uh, last year in my freshman course. I had a student come, up, come to me and he said, you know, I'm interested in cybersecurity. And I wonder if there's such a thing as, as space cybersecurity, that is, um, security of computer and communications assets in space. Well, of course there is. And he wondered how he could connect with it. And I didn't know personally, but I knew a guy at JPL who works in the systems engineering area. And I asked him and he actually hooked up with a space, a space cybersecurity group at JPL. And uh, I kind of hooked this guy up and he got an interview and he actually did an internship at JPL last summer in this group. So this is the kind of thing that happens and it only, um, the only way I was able to just casually ask somebody about this was because we have JPL people on our faculty. Uh, and, and also because they're close enough that it was easy for him to, to, to just go and get an interview and do an internship. So, so yes, we have a, we have a, a fairly tight relationship with, with uh, JPL in particular, but actually several NASA centers across the board. All right. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Carson has the next question and talks about uh, essentially astronautics is not common as a degree program and usually you have aerospace engineering degree programs. And so uh, he's basically asking, is the astronautics program any good? <laughs> because are people just only hiring aerospace engineers? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll preface this question, but I'll let everybody jump in. Uh, I know there's a lot of history here, especially between Dr. Gruntman and Dr. Irwin on astronautics becoming its own program. If it wasn't going to be successful and students weren't successful afterwards, we wouldn't have it. I'll tell you that much right now. And students are regularly hired. And also your specific jobs, this is a little bit what Dr. Reisman was talking about before, are not necessarily defined by the specific astronautical engineering degree program. You might be working on a project side by side with an aerospace engineer and a mechanical engineer. So don't, it's it's not the idea. This is a question we get so often that like, is it too specialized? Am I, am I pigeonholing myself? And you definitely are not, but I wanna let our faculty jump into this process to talk about astronautical engineering and the unique elements that it is its own degree program outside of aerospace. 
So I can provide a little bit of the statistical kind of approach. So we are unique, we are one of the unique programs in the country is focused on space engineering. And one of the reasons that the department was created because uh, traditional aerospace departments really are dominated by the aeronautical component, which is a fluid mechanics uh, linked to the aviation. And the space is sort of a second class citizens in many departments. But what is uh, very important uh, in terms of uh, evaluating uh, whether it's the program is valuable or not is uh, the following. On the master's level, and again, our undergraduate program and, and the graduate programs, they are together. So it's uh, part of the bigger entity. But on the master's level, we already mentioned that many engineers who work in the industry they take degrees part-time. All the big companies allow their engineers to choose basically any program they want to pursue master's degree, any program in the country. There is a real competition there. And these people, engineers, they're advised by their senior peers, senior colleagues in Boeing's, Lockheed's, and the JPL and others. And if these engineers are coming to get them their master's degree from USC, that means that our program provides something of value for the practicing engineers. And our master's component continuously grows. It has been growing for the last 15 years, 15 plus years after the establishment of the department. This is a clear indication that the, how the program is structured. And again, undergraduate program is a part of the bigger program together with the masters. So the way how the program is structured, what it emphasizes and what kind of education it provides valued by the real consumers of the workforce, space workforce, our industry and government centers. Um, our graduates do go work in the space industry and our, the people who come into this major are people who are interested in space and that's what they want to do. So this major as measured by what happens to people after they graduate over many years, our first graduating class actually was in, in 2006 um, and the first the first class that, that came all the way through four years in the program was in 2009. So we've had over a decade of experience and our students do get to do what they said they wanted to do when they came in. So if you are interested in space and that's your big thing, then, then this is a pretty good major for you. And furthermore, as Professor Grumman pointed out, this is the physical location for you because Los Angeles is where the space industry is. Um, now, it's not necessary that you stay in the space industry. Um, Professor Riesman mentioned an interesting thing, which I'll sort of follow up on. Um, you know, there's this industry of, uh, that's just coming online of self-driving cars. These people are Silicon Valley people. They don't have a culture of safety. They have a culture of getting products out quickly um, and self-driving cars, they don't understand how to make them safe and, and ultra reliable. Who knows how to make things safe and ultra reliable? The aerospace industry and a number of recent PhDs from the USC astronautics program um, have actually who worked a number of years in industry in some cases JPL some cases aerospace corporation um, have moved over and now have senior positions in self-driving cars with the idea of advising them how to do systems engineering relating to large very safe systems which they don't know so there are these kind of crossovers that happen so. We have our expertise in the industry, which now other people are, are needing. That's great. Um, there are two questions I'm going to combine here. It is uh, Jessica's and Gavin's, which all have to do with undergraduates getting involved in research. How really can they do it? What's it like? Gavin wants to be extra close to you. He wants to know how close he can get to you in his question, if I'm reading his question correctly, <laughs> how closely are students able to work with professors? Uh, I'm assuming he doesn't mean physically, but uh, yeah, you know, let's, let's talk about Paul, there are, there are some legal constraints. Uh, or you know, physical distancing requirements, et cetera. But uh, <laughs> I'm not certain what Gavin's getting at there. But basically, uh, let's talk about undergraduates getting involved in research. My, my short answer is as early as you like just getting involved with faculty and getting to know them. But uh, let's talk about your experience of having undergrads in labs. I'll, I'll try to take that. I apologize yeah. for dropping off the dog. Oh, uh, pulled back. the power cable. Um, <laughs> he got to something. He finally got uh, to it. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I think there's a number of answers there. Uh, the Viterbi especially is pushing really hard to provide a, uh, a more robust capability for undergraduates to start doing research even in freshman year. There's actually a program called CURVE. Uh, forgive me, I forget the exact acronym for it. The, the Center for Undergraduate Research at Viterbi Engineering. Viterbi Engineering, the there you go, thanks very so much. It's the most forced acronym ever. Uh, yeah, but, but, it, but it works. So I, and I can say that I, I actually have uh, this semester, I have eight uh, undergraduate students mm -hmm. that are supporting various projects that are coming out. Um, so there's a, there's a school level that's pushing undergraduate research to support. Um, and then there's, uh, there's the student organizations, which specifically Dan uh, mentioned, and there's a number of them that are out there that you can involve with. But then relative to sort of the, the faculty, um, at least from my standpoint, I'd indicate that I'm lucky enough to be able to, to run a center and the center is able to bring in various faculty and staff. We work with engineers from other companies, um, but especially we utilize undergraduates. Now, the interesting thing about undergraduate research during the semester is that typically your class schedules take up most of the day. And so the, it's a tough thing to sort of fit it in. Student groups are actually good because they typically meet afterwards and that's fine. Um, doing other kinds of either faculty or sponsored research, which happens sort of during the normal work hour, sometimes it's a little difficult. Um, out at the, at the CERC that I have, the majority of the students that I have are graduate students. And uh, that's both because they're taking that next level, but also because they have classes in the evening. But I do have a number of undergraduates and um, I specifically bring undergraduates in uh, almost at any level on projects. And then they'll work within a team and that team is make it up of both undergraduates and graduates. Um, I get involved as well as some of the other staff get involved specifically with various aspects of the projects. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll also point out is that, I'm not sure if Dan, you talked about it, but we actually have uh, numbered courses inside the Ashnox curriculum that uh, focus on, I think it's lunar lander, microsatellites and rocket propulsion that are called project courses. Now they don't run all the time. It really depends upon, is there enough individuals that actually take the course that semester? But as an example, pre-COVID in 2019, um, we were lucky enough to have 20 students, undergraduate students that were all working on building the very first student built CubeSat here at USC. Um, the plan had been to launch it in 2020 we all sort of know what happened in 2020, which it didn't happen. So actually trying to, to resurrect that again. So in terms of undergraduates having opportunities for uh, research at, at Viterbi and especially within the Ash Knox department, we have a plethora of, uh, of opportunities. Thank you for that. Let's move on to Carson's questions. I, I'm going to read it verbatim because it's going to be fun here. I believe that someone mentioned that a degree in astronautics would cover chemical and electric propulsion systems, but are there any courses which cover more theoretical systems like magnetoplasma dynamic and nuclear thermal thrusters? Uh, we have a course in that exact set of stuff. It's in the graduate <laughs> curriculum. You can, uh, you can take it as an undergraduate if you're getting near, uh, near to the time you're graduating. So yes, we do. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, Alexander asks, I'm interested in both uh, aeronautics and astrophysics. As a Viterbi student, can I double major in aeronautics and physics, astrophysics, which is heads up, we don't have an aeronautics degree, we have an astronautical engineering degree and an aerospace engineering degree. So I'm assuming you mean one of those. Uh, you can always do more work if you want. We will gladly accept tuition checks from you for as long as you want to be enrolled. Um, but just realize that the more work that you enroll in, the more classes you need to take, the longer it will take you. And our, an engineering degree is a full four-year program. But that's why a lot of students like to maybe minor, maybe take some additional courses, and students have a variety of interests. And I would also encourage you to think outside of the, the STEM box, you know, the opportunity to take dance classes, cinema classes, uh, political science. All of these opportunities are at USC. Why stick within the same box? Because you're going to get a lot of that physics uh, inside of this degree, it's already built in. But you have, if you want to keep going, hey, there, there's more opportunities for you. That's there. very interesting. Aeronautics and astrophysics. I'm not sure how you are, uh, can get to the stars by flapping the wings. Hey, there's a helicopter on Mars. What do you want? Yeah. <laughs> but you need to get there first. All right, we're, we're, we're already getting into the, the competitive uh, environment, which I'm going to, that's going to be my last question for you all. So heads up, but we're, we're, I'm going to put you head to head with another department at the end. 
Um, Matt asked this question from Sydney, Australia, and it's a question directly for Dr. Reisman. Can you tell us about your experience on the ISS and the research you conducted whilst on board? Wow. Uh, I think we only got about five minutes left, so yeah, it would be pretty hard to answer that first question. Cliff's notes. <laughs> uh, it was great. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, and as uh, really when I was up there, that was the height of the construction of the ISS. So we were doing a bunch of spacewalks to assemble, uh, uh, connect new modules, uh, add new robots to the outside. Uh, we were installing uh, new equipment that came up and, and uh, really, really was more about construction and research at that time. We did do some science experiments, but it, it was not really the focus. Now, now uh, utilization and, and science experiments really are uh, it's kind of flipped. Now they're doing a lot more of that these days. Awesome. My last question, because I do want to be mindful of everyone's time. I, I, I teased it a minute ago, and, and we do this from time to time. Uh, I want to pit you up against aerospace mechanical engineering. And our students, I'm encouraging our students to go visit the aerospace mechanical engineering session next week. And it's another plug for that. It's in the chat. You can do that. And I will encourage those students to watch this recording if they didn't attend. But why air astronautical engineering over aerospace mechanical engineering Let, let's fight it out let's let's see what happens and uh, of course i will be on your side the whole time i wouldn't fight at all uh well we, we are much more interesting and better but seriously all our students undergraduate students regardless of the major you can take technical electives outside of your major it is exceptionally important to follow your passion and if during the studies you take as much courses outside as you can, because, because perhaps you can find something that is much more important for you that you enjoy. You don't want to end up with a job from nine to five that you hate and hate the world. You want to be a professional who loves what you do. So follow your passion. And if you are interested in space, we're here for you. I've had students go both ways in the sense that I've had students who take my sophomore astro course as aerospace engineering students because it's a required space course for them and they say and uh, some of them have come to me afterwards and said you know I didn't like space at all now I do and they moved to astro but it also happens it's happened the other way I've had students who have who have uh, I've suggested that they take flight mechanics uh, as, as a tech elective because it's a really interesting thing and they take it and they think, wow, aircraft are really cool. I had, you know, I just somehow never got into airplane, airplanes and they transferred to aerospace. So it's just what Professor Gruntman said, do what you like. If you want to be in space, come to us. If you want to do aircraft, go to aerospace. If you know, there's, if you want to do cars or lots of other things, go to mechanical engineering. If you don't know, go to mechanical engineering. <laughs> That's a really great point to end on. And I'll, I'll, I'll tie it all together with, with where you are in this application process for all of our guests. When you're looking at our application process, you need to choose one of the Viterbi School majors to list as your first choice major on the application. Don't stress out about it. Use this advice. What sounds the coolest to you right now? Because you're not locked into it. When you're admitted to one of our Viterbi engineering majors, you're actually admitted to them all. And switching is as easy as telling us. And so the opportunities that Dr. Irwin talked about where a student will start and astro and move to aero and end up in mechanical or vice versa and any other combination in between happens all the time as you explore and as you experience more of the engineering curriculum it's a natural thing to evolve and to change as you start looking at this but from the outside looking in what sounds the coolest start there you have great faculty such as these fine four gentlemen that will be taking care of you and your courses because you'll be taught by them you'll be engaging with them and you'll have the environment where you'll learn this process and continue to learn as you move throughout your professional degree uh, once again, thank you to all of our faculty, Dr. Irwin, Dr. Reisman, Professor Barnhart, and Dr. Gruntman. I really appreciate you all spending time with us and speaking to our prospective students and family members. For all of our students out there, thank you for joining us. If you missed any part of this, the recording will be up on our website where you registered. And if you want to visit any of our other faculty roundtable sessions, you can register for any of those uh, as they are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all, everybody. Thank you again, guys. Have a great evening. Cheers. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. everybody. Good luck. Good luck.